you just you're just gonna bust in whenever you want. Coming. Jeff, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Um, I am so thrilled to see a full room of people again today. So this is wonderful. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Amanda Carlin. I'm the manager of the Indigenous Initiatives here at the Faculty of Law. I'd like to start by recognizing that this is traditional land that has been taken care of for upwards of 15,000 years by various groups of people, including the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Sasagas of the Credit River. I'm a Métis woman from Treaty 1 territory, so I'm a guest and I'm very uh, grateful to get to live here, work here, raise my son on this beautiful land that is particularly beautiful at this season. And I'm grateful not to be in my home of Winnipeg that is covered with snow. <laughs> um, finding unique and meaningful ways to honor this land and honor the uh, people who take care of this land is a challenge for a lot of people um, across the territory, but also on campus. And I wanted to share with you a piece of good news. You may have heard that on Friday of last week, there was a ceremony to open the office of the Mississaugas of the Credit River at Massey College. So our colleagues at Massey have created an office for chief and council and all of their community members that want to spend time on campus here. And uh, that was a big ceremony uh, last week that included the Lieutenant Governor and the Mayor and um, Justice LaForme and Chief LaForme and uh, Carolyn Bennett was there, although she was like hidden behind a, a podium and I wasn't sure if that was because they weren't sure if she was gonna win her seat or not. So they kind of like put her behind there just in case. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm now going to turn to introducing our two guests today, who I have the privilege of calling my colleagues, but also my um, friends. Um, the first is to my immediate left, Meg Uente is a partner at the firm of Ophius Clear Townshend, LLP. She's a member of Serpent River First Nation, and she has a broad practice serving First Nations governance, governments and their related entities businesses and not-for-profit corporations. She advises on treaty and abor aboriginal rights in litigation and negotiation, human rights of indigenous people, and in particular, equality for First Nations children and individuals in program services, in particular, in the child welfare system. She does not excel at short sentences. I'm sorry. <laughs> Someone else wrote it. <laughs> Maybe has a diverse practice in First Nations governance, including employment and labor law. She's appeared in courts and tri and in courts of appeal and trial level courts in Ontario, Newfoundland and Labrador, and the federal court, as well as before arbitrators and adjudicators and commercial arbitrations, labor arbitrations and adjudications under the Canada Labor Code. In addition to introducing Maggie, I am going to offer to rewrite her biography. <laughs> go for it, I can't wait. I welcome it. Uh, Maggie is alumni from this program. Uh, she graduated with an LLB and MSW. She also is alumni of McGill. She is the past president of the Board of Directors at Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto, which is how she came into my life as a friend and mentor to me. Uh, she was a commissioner at the Ontario Human Rights Commission from 2006 until 2015. She's listed as the most frequently recommended in the area. Not the most, among the most. Sorry, <laughs> not the most. Uh, well, when I write it, it'll say the most. <laughs> in Indigenous law by Lexpert. Um, she's a member of the Indigenous Bar Association, the Ontario Bar, and the Newfoundland and Labrador, Labrador Bar. Uh, Sinead Charbonneau is a, is a significantly <laughs> shorter biographer. <laughs> guest and treaty beneficiary on Anishinaabe territories and was raised on, Le I'm not sure how to pronounce that word. Lekonde. I would not have gone with that, so thank you. <laughs> Lands. She received her JD from University of Toronto in 2017, so she's recently an alumni. She's an associate at OKT, and her focus is on promoting and protecting the rights of First Nations children, youth, and families. Her goal is to work alongside First Nations to realize their visions for family and community well-being. And I'm sure, as you will hear today, um, she is already realizing that goal very early into her practice. Um, these are two amazingly intelligent, funny, and kind people. Um, to say that they are busy would be a drastic understatement. They, the fact that they are both in Toronto at this very time That's is astounding true. because <laughs> they travel a lot and it means a lot to me that you were willing to come and share your knowledge and your experience and expertise with us today. So please help me welcome Maggie and Shanae. Thank you. I'm Maggie. This is Sinead. Um, that was an unduly long biography, which I will note Amanda read by choice, not because I told her to. Um, okay, so I'm 
I'm going to start because your students, or mostly aside from I see some professors and uh, clinic directors and old friends in the room, um, by telling you a little bit about where I came from uh, and how I came to do this work. And then I think Sinead can do the same because I think both of sort of our backgrounds um, and perspectives inform kind of how we're doing work for Indigenous children, but also like how we came to do it. So I am not by design or training a children's rights person. I am an Aboriginal law, Aboriginal governments person, a Section 35 person, and an equality law human rights person. Um, and then that combination of that things, those things, um, along with Judith Ray, who's our colleague uh, at OKT, also a U of T alumni person, um, who had done quite a bit of work on social services and the way in which um, the legal frameworks of social services delivery for Indigenous people in Ontario works. Um, when the Caring Society decision was decided in 2016, that is when we started working um, on the Caring Society case in terms of remedies. And the reason why they asked us to do that is because I had a background in human rights remedies. I'd had been a human rights commissioner, um, and it was something that I had worked on quite a bit. Not at all because I really knew that much about um, children's services or children's rights. So, um, but I do know a lot about how First Nations governments work, and I knew I know enough about remedies, I guess, to have made me at least qualified enough to do it in our client's mind. So we work for Chiefs of Ontario on that, and then um, I actually also work quite a bit with the Inu communities in Labrador about um, equality of social services stuff and things that are coming out of the Caring Society decision. Mm -hmm. Nature of now. Um, am I supposed to use this? Yeah, just hold it up to you. Like okay. A okay. Motivational speaker. Oh, like a tiny, tiny violin. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I might be Métis, but I don't play the violin, just for the record. So, um, so my name is Sinead, and I'm really grateful to be here. Um, and thank you, Amanda, for acknowledging that it's difficult for us to get together. But um, I'll say to the students in the room that I'll always make time for students. Law school was a very, very difficult experience for me, uh, especially spiritually. It, it really broke me down and made me question what I was doing and whether this was the right path for me and where my place was and whether I would ever be able to feel whole again uh, in the advocacy that I do. And I can tell you that I love being a lawyer. I love my practice. Um, I'm excited about it every day. Day. I'm also challenged by it spiritually and emotionally and intellectually but uh, for those of you for whom law school has been a difficult experience I can tell you that for me it got a lot better um, and if there's I would encourage you to talk about that with among each other and to build those relationships and be honest about what it's like because Although being a lawyer for me has been a lot uh, more meaningful, it's not easier. It's very, very difficult, and the transition from articling into practice uh, has been really hard. And I've, I would say that I have uh, you know, compromise some of the other areas of my life pretty significantly in order to do a good job for my clients. So, bit of a downer, but I just want to be. Um, I just want to be honest with all of you, right? So, enjoy the time uh, while you can, while you're here, going to lectures and talking with your colleagues about ideas and things that interest you because when you actually get start uh, hitting the road in, in practice, you will have less time for that than you might want. So um, I came to practice children's rights law, I think, from my own experience as a child. Um, that's what I would like to say that my experience with child welfare started. And just the acknowledgement that how grateful I am that I was able to be raised in my family home. And if a few things had been different, if it had been the child welfare system of today, uh, that probably wouldn't have been the case. And I am who I am because of that, for all the good and the bad that that is. So um, while I was in law school, I had a few different you know, summer jobs and, and whatnot. Um, and then I articled at the Office of the Children's Lawyer, which was amazing. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Office of the Children's Lawyer, and I articled with Shani, so I'd like to give a shout out to Shani, she's here as well, uh, and she was uh, an amazing uh, person to work with, and I'm, I'm really grateful to see you again. The Office of the Children's Lawyer provides independent legal representation to children in a few areas, and the, the part that I was most interested in is cases of child protection. So where a, where a child is before the courts in Ontario in a child protection case, uh, they're assigned their own independent lawyer. It's funded by the government, but acts totally independently to put forward the views and preferences of the child. So that's what I did, and as I was finishing up there, I was contacted by Maggie's firm, and Maggie has, was my mentor. I had just reached out to her to say, hey, I need some help navigating this world um, because no one in my family had ever you know gone to university or been a lawyer or done any of that so I just felt like I needed somebody that could help me understand what 
what this world looked like and how I could move in it well. And that's how I reached out to Maggie. So as, as I was finishing up at the Office of the Children's Lawyer, they asked me, would you be interested in interviewing with us uh, to do some work? Someone's going on maternity leave. And that's how I came to be involved with the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada versus Canada case. And it's been, um, I don't know, going on two years now that I will have been at uh, OKT, and I love it. And it's, uh, we've, we've really built up our children's rights practice to be something quite unique in Canada. Um, and I think we'll hope Hopefully have a chance to tell you more about that after we talk a bit about the case. But that's by way of introduction how I got into that. I'm clipping it back on because I can't talk and this tiny mic, it's too ridiculous. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, I'll do a little bit of the background about what the case was uh, or is about for those who aren't familiar. So the case was launched, I, how many, is it 13 years ago? Yeah, 2006. Um, 2006. Uh, at the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, and the claim was, uh, and continues to be, that uh, the agencies which provide, uh, or the entities and agencies which provide child and family services to First Nations children on reserve were um, unequally funded by the Canadian government, and that that was discri a discriminatory practice. So that complaint came to be filed by the Caring Society with the Assembly of First Nations after there had already been kind of a protracted period of study uh, within the Canadian government, it, in fact, by the Canadian government in um, collaboration with Cindy Blackstock, the Caring Society's uh, leader, and they had, you know, researched it and done a bunch of reports and determined that yes, there was unequal funding, that the unequal funding scheme created incentives for uh, agencies to bring First Nations children into the care of the state as opposed to keeping them within their families um, through the use of something called prevention services, um, that the capital expenses of First Nations were not, First Nations agencies were not being funded equally, et cetera. Um, and in Ontario, that it's a bit of a different funding regime, but that also in Ontario that there was um, unequal funding and that that led to the disproportionate over-representation of First Nations children in uh, the child, in, in state care. So that case, um, they had done a bunch of studies, and then of course Canada did nothing. I say of course because that's like my whole career, but yes, of course Canada did nothing. They decided not to implement the recommendations that these studies had done, and so because of that, Cindy Blackstock's uh, group, which represents the, the First Nations agencies in Canada, and the Assembly of First Nations launched a human rights complaint. And that went, that took uh, you know over 10 years for there to be a decision, and that partially because uh, at the time, it was the Harper government who had put up a lot of barriers with respect to various aspects of um, the law of discrimination. So, for instance, they said that because there was no comparator group, because uh, the Canadian government didn't provide any funding to any other uh, parties for First Nations Child Family Services, that there was no complaint to be had because there was no comparator group. They said that service provision was not, did not include funding, even though um, then INAC, now Indigenous Services Canada, is really intimately involved in what kinds of services are provided because of the way the funding agreements work. And so there were a bunch of JRs, sorry, judicial reviews up and down uh, within the federal court system and up to the Supreme Court, et cetera, um, before the case actually got to be, start to be heard on its merits, which was shockingly only sort of in 2014, I think. It's, it's, they did the merits over a year, I think, and as I say, we weren't involved then. And then they got a decision um, about a year after the case closed, and that was in uh, February, January 2016, mm -hmm. sorry. To CHRT 2016, <laughs> <laughs> and that case uh, found that there was indeed that the funding the unequal funding regime was uh, discriminatory, and part of um, it's funny uh, Canada didn't actually put up a substantive defense to the notion that it was discriminatory. They relied on some of these technical defenses about there being no comparator group, etc. So they didn't have anything to say about the fact that they were unequally funding First Nations kids. They were just suggesting that First Nations kids didn't have a remedy at the tribunal because of that unequal funding. Um, so the tribunal had made that decision and they quite um, sort of briefly set out what the, um, what the remedy was. They said that Canada was ordered to stop discrimination, ordered to renegotiate the 1965 agreement, which is the intergovernmental agreement in Ontario, which provides for funding uh, for child and family services as well as some other social services. And uh, they also said that they had to uh, apply a different definition of Jordan's principle. So Jordan's principle was sort of litigated within the body of this case and Jordan's principle was a um, House of Commons statement actually only not a law that said that uh, says that First Nations kids should have equal social services as other kids do. 
without delay. So that was sort of January 2016. And then um, what happened was, again, nothing. Um, so nothing really happened. The Trudeau government had just been elected. Uh, and then in about March, the, they introduced their budget. And their budget for 2016 included, frankly, like quite modest amounts of funding increases for certain kinds of services for um, agencies and for First Nations kids. And also introduced a only somewhat expanded application of Jordan's principle. Uh, and they continue to sort of um, perpetuate the discrimination by applying Jordan's principle quite narrowly to only certain kinds of children with certain kinds of conditions or disabilities, et cetera. And so that was sort of enough is enough. And then um, the tribunal at that point had also come to the parties and said, what we're going to do is ask you for, uh, we're going to ask you questions about what should be the immediate relief pending the long-term reform of the system. May I just say something? So sure part of it is um, that human rights tribunal cases are, are different than other kinds of cases and that the tribunal retains an oversight role in the implementation of its own orders. Or it can. Or can. And so in this case, that's that's how that, um, that's why the tribunal continued to be involved and work with the parties and come up with, non we came up with uh, different submissions and non-compliance orders that Maggie's going to talk about. It's not like in an ordinary court case where you go to court, you get your order, and then it's finished and it's up to the parties to implement or enforce um, through their own means or through contempt of court. In human rights, the practice and the relationship with the tribunal is a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah, so they said, we're going to come back to you and ask you for, ask you questions about what should immediate relief be. So they did that, and it was a bit of a, they kind of lost control of the bus a little bit. It was a, it was a little bit of a um, haphazard process where, whatever. And so eventually, every, the party sort of got fed up and said, listen, um, we're going to go back to the tribunal and say that they have not done enough in terms of immediate relief. Um, if particularly in Ontario, the budgetary increases were extremely modest. Um, and uh, not didn't really at all address kinds of what the what I would say like the loci of discrimination were that were identified by the tribunal, um, and so we went back to the tribunal to say like you need to order more immediate relief. In the meantime, they made all these other non-compliance orders about how Jordan's principle was being implemented. I mean, several of them. They had to go back and back and the caring society went back and back and back again about Jordan's principle. Canada kept on either mispublicizing what, uh, what the deal was or denying kids, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So then we went back and I think we filed our motions in November of 2016 and they were heard in March of 2017 um, by the tribunal and then we did not get a decision on them until February 2018. Mm -hmm. So then we waited almost a whole year. Um, there were a lot of different motions, <laughs> right, about a lot of different things. Um, there still are. There's still a lot of different motions about a lot of different things happening. And so um, then we got that decision. But that decision, that decision was incredibly um, generous to the First Nations parties. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, also, what had not been happening was there had not been any other overtures by the Canadian government to uh, any of the First Nations parties or to Cindy Blackstock's group. There had basically been no discussions about what program reform would look like. The Assembly of, and they, what they, Canada had done is aside from having its budget is they appointed someone who was like the special interlocutor who basically just like went around and did interviews with First Nations parties and came up with a set of findings which were basically the identi and identical to the findings of the studies that had been done uh, 10, 15 years prior, and the one-day reports which were the foundation of the case. Like, she didn't really, it was like, oh, First Nations people should have more control over their services, and like, the agencies are underfunded, and that was sort of Canada's effort. Um, so one of the things that Assembly of First Nations had requested in this round of asking for more compliance orders was that um, Canada be required to negotiate with us about what long-term reform looks like for the child welfare system. Anyway, ultimately it was resoundingly successful. All of the parties got every single thing that they wanted um, out of that. So for our part, um, we got an order saying that there should be un basically unlimited money for band representation services under the Child, Youth, and Family Services Act, formerly the Child Family Services Act. Um, First Nations have a right to participate in child welfare proceedings involving their citizens. So we said that those, those services uh, that arise out of that and, um, and representation of court should be funded at the actual cost. And that is obviously an unusual order, like obviously mark this moment when I want unlimited money <laughs> for any party. <laughs> That's clearly like obviously a real high point in my life and will be, will be forever. But the reason why that is is because 
um, pr protection services are funded for First Nations kids at actual costs. And so that, uh, and that was what kind of created this perverse incentive found the tribunal to take kids into care because they won't fund services to keep kids out of care, but they will 100% fund the cost of putting kids into state care. And so at actuals became kind of the, um, uh, the thing that we asked for because it was already a reality within child and family services. Of course, um, you know, I think in that um, INAC's defense was like, well, we couldn't possibly know what that would look like. And, uh, you know, the parties were like, but we already do this. Like, this is something that's already done within First Nations Child and Family Services, so it's not a r completely ridiculous thing. Cindy Blackstock's group got prevention services at actuals for First Nations kids. A um, uh, whole bunch of capital costs, and the AFN got its... Um, consultation committee order. Mm -hmm. So there's then formed. So then after that, things started to change. I'll note also that after that, um, Minister Bennett was replaced on the file by Minister Phil Pott, uh, who was, had formerly been uh, the health minister. And then that, that was around the time that they split INAC into two groups. They split it into Indigenous Services Canada and what's called CERNA, which is Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs, I think. Um, so then when, when I, I don't want to call her Philpot, even though obviously that's what we all call her behind her back. When Minister, then Minister Philpot <laughs> took over the case, like things actually started to move. She actually did, I think, have quite a bit of political um, will to kind of move things forward. And so things started moving. We did constitute our consultation committee table. We started having discussions about things that would uh, carry on. One of the things that the Ontario Chiefs had asked for was a study to examine exactly how to remedy the discrimination in Ontario because the Ontario funding situation is different. Um, and then we started, uh, Sinead really started, well Sinead had sort of started work at our firm at that time and you started doing a lot of your work implementing the decision with First Nations. So why don't you mm -hmm, sure. grab the tiny mic and talk about okay. that. Okay. I'd like, can I not use this because I want to stand up, is that okay? You can walk with it, like, in, like a motivational speaker. That's, that's too much. I'm just going to put it <laughs> like down. Tom I just want to write down the citations <laughs> for the key cases for you guys. So it's 2016 CHRT2. That's the one, that's the main decision on the merits where the Canada was found to have committed racial discrimination against First Nations children. Um, 2017 uh, CHRT14. This is the most important decision on the implementation and definition of Jordan's principle. And 2018 CHRT 4, which is the case regarding prevention at actuals for First Nations agencies as well as pre uh, band representative services at actuals. So um, I think there's a few things that I want to talk about in each of these cases, but they're all related. The first thing is something just about human about human rights. And when I talk to First Nations communities about this, I like to try and um, just articulate what the difference is between human rights and other other legal systems and other ways of think, other ways of thinking about rights. So, of course, in uh, Western Canadian law, most of our legal systems are structured around a, a, a right on one hand and an obligation on the other hand. Right. So, I have a right to be protected from unwanted bodily contact. You have an obligation not to or a duty not to infringe, not to assault me. Right. And in indigenous legal systems, there isn't always a right and a duty. Right? Sometimes you can have an obligation to, for example, protect the water, but you have no right to the water. The water has its own existence, its own power, its own systems, and you have, a, you have an obligation to protect it and you have no right to access it. So human rights are somewhere in between, the way I think about it, is that they're somewhere in between those and there's something somewhat close to the sacred. Human rights, we can say, of course, in Canada, we would say they exist because they're codified within the Canadian Human Rights Act or the Ontario Human Rights Code. But, they, it, but their source isn't just the codification. Their source is who we are as human beings, which is our place within the overall system and cosmology of the world. And recognizing the uniqueness of our place as human beings and the core rights that we have that come from our status within the ecosystem, I think is something that is at least slightly analogous to the way that we might think about indigenous legal systems, right? So it's not a direct, it's not um, directly the same or anything like that. I would never collapse the complexity of indigenous law into being human rights, but I think there is a reference point in it. And I think that that's an important thing about why human rights are different. And it's also an important thing to think about why this case is different. Because when Canada 
discriminated against First Nations children, it's not the same as giving Canada a speeding ticket or a fine. It is saying that Canada violated the humanity of those children. It treated those children as less than human. And that's what this case is really about, right? So as much as it's about how do we reform child welfare from the ground up and how do we help First Nations to um, you know, build up their capacity, that's my, those are my goals. At the end of it, that's what happened. It, it, indigenous children had their fundamental humanity violated and nothing that we can do now is going to be able to remedy that. That's, that's the basis that I work from. So what we're doing is a kind of harm reduction. We're trying to create buffers within the community so that they can regain some capacity to do harm reduction when their families are negotiating with the state, which is what it is. CAS is the state. And oftentimes, CAS presents itself, even Indigenous CASs. For those of you who don't know, in Ontario, we have First Nations Child Welfare Agencies. And there's 12 of them, and two in the process of being mandated. And they cover most of the province. And they um, are created under provincial law and have to follow the obligations of provincial law. But they are beholden to boards of directors that are comprised of chiefs, right? And on the other hand, we have non-Indigenous uh, children's aid societies, which is the vast majority of the children's aid societies. And First Nations families interact with, with both systems. But that's just by way of some, uh, for you to understand some of the, uh, the context. But whenever a child or a family is negotiating with the CAS, they're negotiating with the arm of the state. And so First Nations, in this case, First Nations are trying to get some power back so that when the First Nation is negotiating with the state on, on its behalf to protect its rights as a nation, um, they can actually have an opportunity to have some kind of a say. There's no equality. There's no equality in the child welfare system. It's the arm of the state versus First Nations governments that have been discriminatorily underfunded for decades, um, and First Nations families that have been living through those discriminatory, those discriminatory systems. Um, so just that note about human rights, it's a bit off, maybe might seem off tangent, but when I'm trying to explain to communities, and this is just a note for some of you lawyers in the room, when I work 90% of my time, I work in First Nations communities, and I have to think of new ways to try and make this case meaningful for them. And First Nations have lived for hundreds of years with the government violating their rights. So it can be hard to describe why this case is different and why the ownership that First Nations can take over this case is different. So I've tried to think about other ways of explaining it, and that's one way that I have. Should I talk about Jordan's principle? Go for it. OK. So that's the, any questions for us so far? No. OK. So the other really important thing that I want to talk about is, and it, you guys, I would recommend to you to, to read this case, um, or at least portions of it anyways, is about Jordan's Principle. If you could just raise your hands, how many of you have heard of Jordan's Principle? You don't need oh, to, be, to be shy if you haven't. So, so it seems like most of you have. So um, I don't know how much background, but I'll just be real quick. So Jordan's Principle is named after um, Jordan River. Oh, sorry, Maggie. Look at you. This is, the kind of part, this is the kind of partner you want. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> life partner. <no. laughs> um, it's not that kind of firm. <laughs> <laughs> um, she moves away. <laughs> no, right. Harsh. OK, so uh, Jordan's principal <laughs> is named after um, Jordan River Anderson, who is a young boy from Norway House Cree Nation, which is in Manitoba. And Jordan was born with really complex medical needs. And his medical needs required him in the early stage of his life to be in the hospital 24-7. Um, and because of his medical needs, everybody knew, him, his caregivers, the doctors knew that he was going to have a short life and he was going to have a very hard life. Uh, but at a certain point in his care, uh, it became evident and the doctors recommended that he should go home. That he could go home, but he was going to need 24-hour care in his home and adaptive equipment and things like that. And that was the recommendation of the doctors. And from that, uh, his family advocated for him to be returned home to his First Nation, to Norway House Cree Nation. And the hospital said, well, we're not paying for that because this is an Indian child. And um, the federal government, as you know, pursuant to 9124 of the Constitution Act, says that they're responsible for Indians and lands reserved for the Indians. And the federal government said, but that's a health care issue. And health care is in the purview of the provinces. So we're not paying for that. So this First Nations child was stuck between two levels of government fighting over who should pay for his at-home care. And he died in the hospital, and he never got to spend a single day of his short life in his family home. 
And his name is Jordan River Anderson, and that's why it's called Jordan's Principle. And we don't use the term JP, we say Jordan's Principle to bring his spirit into being when we talk about this case. So uh, Jordan died, and out of basically the context of his life and the tragedy that that, that came about was this um, motion, or what would you call it, at the good, House of Commons. Declaration in the House of Commons. Some kind of something by a bunch of white people in the House of Commons <laughs> that a, a bunch of other white people failed to do anything about, which, um, you know, is par for the course. And uh, so Jordan's principle became a part of this case. And you might ask yourself how it is that Jordan's principle, which is, you know, a principle about no disruption in, jur in support for First Nation children between two jurisdictions, what that has to do with children in care? Well, the, the answer is that Jordan's principle was fit, the government failed to implement Jordan's principle, and in so doing, more children had to enter care because First Nations were forced to put their children in care in order to access services, especially for children with disabilities. And that is, I have to say, even though Jordan's principle still is alive, happens. that still happens really regularly. I'm working on a case about that right now. So Jordan, Jordan's principle, um, that's, that's the origins of it. But what it stands for is something, is something really meaningful. So Jordan's principle stands on the one hand that all services available in the off-reserve context should be provided to First Nations children, especially, we can could say, at the bare minimum in the areas um, of, of child welfare, right? But also think about the mental, spiritual, physical, and emotional well-being of that child. And all services that exist off reserve need to be on reserve, and they need to be at least as good as the services that are off reserve. But in addition to that, so that's the, that's the first part of Jordan's principle. And included within that is that there should be no denial or delay related to the child's First Nation status. So what happened to Jordan should never happen again. On the other hand, the other key part of Jordan's principle is something called substantive equality. And I think Maggie can, could definitely speak to this um, from, a, from a legal perspective, and it's, very, it's a very important idea. But I'll just tell you a little bit about how I would describe it to, in the communities that I work with. So substantive equality means that the services provided on reserve, not only do they need to be le at least as good, but they also need to recognize the child's culture, child's geographic context, and everything that arises from historical disadvantage. So the services must account for that. So substantive equality needs to be looked at in every single case from the unique perspective of that child and the unique context of their community, okay? Substantive equality, and I think the easiest way to describe it is to, um, to just visualize it a little bit. So if somebody could just come here for one quick second, I promise I won't embarrass you. <laughs> <laughs> you chose to sit in front of you stand, we're standing anyways. Okay, so um, the, I think an easy way to visualize it is to be, is for it to be, imagine a relay race, okay? So you're going to be the First Nations kid, and I'm, I'm the settler kid, and we're, we're both starting at the same time. We're having a relay race, the end, the end of the race is the end of the podium, and they, go, they say, go, time to go. We both start at the I'm same time. I'm looking at the table, too. It's okay, so it's she's perfect. got barriers. <laughs> Who's going to win, right? The settler kid is going to win. So we were treated equally. We were treated the same, but we didn't start from the same place. She started back here because of the context of historical disadvantage, because of the, the lack of culturally appropriate services, because of the geographical context of her family, and I started up here as a settler kid. So Jordan's principle says we have to close the gap. And closing that gap is what substantive equality means. It means you can't treat everyone the same and expect that you're going to have different results. So all services to First Nations children must also respect substantive equality. Do you, do you want to say anything else? About you are a motivational speaker. Oh my god, you embarrassed me. Go ahead. No, I wanted to, for you to talk to them a little bit. So since the order, so I'll just say again, there's also a bunch of outstanding orders still at the tribunal. So. There's a variety of things that the parties have thought that um, were still not being implemented appropriately, even by means of immediate relief. Like we're almost four years after the decision and we're still kind of in immediate relief. Like long-term relief is still pending. Um, and so various ways in which Canada is implementing things or various conditions they put in their funding agreements or whatever that are the subject of litigation at the tribunal on outstanding decisions. And then you may have heard, I guess it was in, on September 6th, mm -hmm. the tribunal did make an order about compensating individual kids uh, or children and or their families for um, discrimination at the hands of the government to the maximum amount allowed under the 
uh, Canadian Human Rights Act, and that uh, decision is under judicial review by the government right now, but there's still a whole bunch of things outstanding that I'm not even sure when we'll get decisions mm -hmm. about them, to be perfectly honest. Yes. Is that the only piece that's so far been JR? Like they did JR a part about Jordan's principle with respect to the timelines, but we settled it. We settled the JR. Okay. It was uh, originally the timelines, the tribunal had imposed very quick time, well, they have imposed very quick timelines for decisions about Jordan's principle applications. And um, some of the, uh, and, and the government wasn't content to, with those particular timelines because there are some exceptional circumstances that might require a longer timeline. Anyway, so they did judicially review, but it settled quite quickly, and so the judicial review was withdrawn. So when you speak about the outstanding pieces, you're talking about like just to Oh my God, I said, did I say pieces? I thought, That's like a real government thing to say. I want to <laughs> hurt myself. <laughs> Yeah, outstanding parts about um, immediate relief, basically. So, for instance, one of the things I'll say, like, it's a, it's a very, like, mundane example in reality, but, like, the tribunal ordered in 2018, the tribunal ordered in 2018 that, um, you know, First Nations would be compensated for their band representative programs at actual cost within, you know, 15 days of putting in their application, and now the government has said, well, no, 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 uh, there's deadlines on that, and you have to you have to have your submission in, you know, within X numbers of days after the fiscal year. That's something we're challenging, because we're saying, like, no, there, the tribunal never said anything about deadlines. You're not entitled to do that. There's sort of arbitrary limits within their terms and conditions about what kinds of money can be used for what kinds of things, particularly, like, capital expenses and, like, weird government definitions about major capital and minor capital, and you can have this kind of money, but you can only use it for major capital, or only use it for minor capital, major capital projects, which are defined as over, projects over $2 million since forever, like literally since like 1981 or something, that, like whatever. So there's a whole bunch of like weird things because of course it's, it's extremely difficult for the government to kind of just take the order and implement it as is. They have to like fit it into their strange policy boxes of which there are, you know, infinite amounts, particularly at Indigenous services. And so there's a lot of things about the way that they're implementing it that people are, that we're challenging as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's, those are bits that are kind of waiting. And, and another thing that's waiting is whether or not the tribunal ought to retain jurisdiction for further periods of time. That's a huge outstanding piece. You know, the parties said, well, look, we haven't even gotten barely even like scratched the surface of talking about what immediate re or what long-term reform looks like and the tribunal should retain jurisdiction mm -hmm. because frankly the only thing that has ever caused them to move is getting an order from the tribunal or um for a long period of time the only thing that ever caused them to move was like there being a motion so we'd have motions starting on like tuesday and then like the friday before we'd get bunches of information or like new things would be announced so that they could go in to the tribunal and say well we just, we just started doing this so the force of the tribunal's uh, continued jurisdiction is something that has been a motivator for Canada, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, it's obviously not, it, it, it hasn't made things perfect, but. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of what that case looks like now and what things look like now, but there's a whole bunch of other kinds of bits, including implementing the orders, and I do want you to talk a little bit about what you're mm -hmm. doing with the communities we work with, um, that have fallen out of that as well. So one of the major things is that the federal government has introduced something called Bill C-92, uh, which it, it doesn't have a short statute name, which is the most irritating thing in the world. So mm -hmm. anyway, I call it the Indigenous Shout. Is that what we're calling it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in act respecting First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children and families. Yeah, I call it yeah. the Indigenous Child Welfare Act. They had a really, they had a short title for it for a while, and it had like a really irritating acronym, and then they so they got rid of it. Ooh, oh yeah, it was the it was the. First Nations Unification. Anyway, it was like the FU Act. I can't remember what it was. And I was like, come on, guys. And so they did change that. It was like the only piece of constructive criticism in the development of that act that they took from me. <laughs> it was like the Families United Act. That's what it was, the yeah. FU Act. And I was like, guys. Um, um, so that is an act which is actually... I mean, there are positive things about it and there are strange things about it. So as a background to that, the federal government said that it was co-developed with First Nations. Don't believe that. That did not happen. Um, the co-development result, like, was us getting a copy of the act on like a Thursday, I don't know, midday, mm -hmm. and then Monday morning having to be in Ottawa to give one day of uh, uh, of comments about it, and then 
them being like, okay, well, you'll never see a second draft of the act and we'll never tell you if we're going to implement these comments. Goodbye. So that's like what this government, this reconciliation-based government's view of co-development is, um, which is, I will say, actually in sharp contrast to like the Provincial Child and well, Child Youth and Family Services Act, which was in fact, like had an extraordinarily long consultation piece with uh, mm -hmm. First Nations governments over many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, but the feds were like, we couldn't possibly give you copies of the statute. And we're like, why? Like, mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so it does, some, it does some good things. It does some bad things. It does some very strange things. It neglects to do a bunch of other things <laughs> that should be done. Um, but one of the things that it does is it recognizes the jurisdiction of First Nations to make laws about child and family services or and it says that there's inherent jurisdiction about child and family services it doesn't say that First Nations have inherent jurisdiction over children and families which is obviously something that First Nations think that they have inherent jurisdiction over they're not actually probably the kinds of people who think that they have an inherent jurisdiction over services mm -hmm. in some way but anyway it's what it is <laughs> I know right it's like a weird anyway Again, not a criticism that was taken. Um, and so it allows First Nations uh, to make, in, make Indigenous laws which will stand on the same footing as federal laws and therefore, in theory, through the uh, operation of our friend Paramountsy, um, be able to supplant uh, provincial laws. It's a little bit unclear as to how that will work. Mm -hmm. And also there are Very some... Very unclear, <laughs> a little bit. Don't, we have to act like we're experts. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are also important limitations within the act, which is uh, the most important one with respect to First Nations jurisdiction is that the act says that to the extent that the First Nations law conforms with the best interests of children. Mm -hmm. So the best interests of the child and the concept of the best interests of the child is something that has been like the bet noir of First Nations since, you know, time immemorial or since child welfare legislation. Which Canada is actually has not done a really good, good job, job looking after the best interests of First Nations children. And, and it's quite, so it's quite unclear because if, for instance, a child welfare worker had a First Nations law in front of them, it's very unclear as to who gets to be the arbiter of what's in the best interest of a child such that you could then override the First Nations law. But like, let me tell you, like Karen from Child Protection is totally doing that. Um, and, be, and she will, I think, feel emboldened to do so because she will have this piece of legislation that says that except to the extent that it's in accordance with First Nations children. So, um, and, and the thing that I think is quite unfortunate about that obviously is that who will suffer out of that kind of uncertainty and frankly very sloppy drafting, very sloppy legislative drafting, will be First Nations children because there will be court battles about whose law is superior. Is it C-92 or, or is it the First Nations law or is it the province's law if there's like a lacuna in either of those two things? And First Nations kids will probably languish in care while those kinds of jurisdictional disputes get sorted. And of course, the Indigenous child welfare legislation made no provision about what happens if there's disputes, um, you know, conflicts of law disputes or whatever about that law. So I'm like not a huge fan of it, but I do think that there are also opportunities, obviously, for First Nations to do things, even very, very quick things, to remove sort of the worst parts of provincial legislation from being applied to them, maybe insert some other kinds of things um, quickly while they're in the process of undertaking sort of more robust law development processes. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that the legislation does is purport to overlay a series of national standards about how First Nations children should be treated in any child welfare system, regardless of whether or not it's a mainstream child welfare system or a First Nations, uh, under a First Nations child welfare law. Some of which are great, like there's placement priorities, that the first placement priority ought to be with the, the child's own First Nation and then with their, or with their own family, then with extended family, like, or then somewhere within the community, somewhere that shares the same language, you know, kind of going down this cascading list. Those things are great, and then there's other things in it that I think are just like a little bit bizarre in terms of what it says, uh, particularly it outlays some considerations about best interests in the child that our clients had some problems with, including like like involvement in the criminal justice system of you know people who are gonna be in care with the child, which is like quite frankly in some communities like almost everybody. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, that's like a weird thing to take into account. Um, mm -hmm. So there's that excitement, um, and then and on another front, a kind of parallel with this, the Ontario Child Youth and Family Services Act had been reformed 
um, in the past several years quite dramatically and quite dramatically and expressly with the purpose of reducing the overrepresentation of children in care. Mm -hmm. It references the United Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People with respect to how children, um, with respect to Indigenous rights, it gives expanded roles for First Nations or Indigenous governments to be involved in decisions about care with respect to uh, their child citizens. And generally, although not perfect, does a, a number of other kind of great things. And then that um, entire piece of legislation was interpreted recently at the Court of Appeal in a case called Kawartha Halliburton Children's Aid Society v. MW. Uh, not me, although I did appear in the case. <laughs> um, and so we were there for an intervener to talk about the notion of sort of community first and what does it mean to maintain a connection to a child's indigenous community, saying that it has to be rooted in land and, and spirit and language and not just this sort of um, pan-Indian kind of approach about communities, which is frankly what the society's preferences are normally when they're like, oh, well, you know, he's going to live in this like Anishinaabe child is going to go over here and live in this Oneida house and then they're going to attend a powwow in London and it's going to be amazing mm -hmm. and they're going to have this great connection to their community day. and so our clients were there to say like that is not how you need to be interpreting the act. You need to be interpreting the act in light of what the First Nations own laws are with respect to what a connection to community looks like. Mm -hmm. So those are some other exciting things that are happening. And then Sinead is doing a bunch of exciting things. Mm -hmm. Should sure. I talk just a bit about, about band band stuff, yeah. oh, Okay. So I'll just talk a little bit about um, the what it kind of day-to-day look maybe for it might be interesting for those of you that are that are students. Um, a glimpse into the life of a band rep lawyer, you could say. So a uh, band rep is kind of a term of art that doesn't actually appear in the legislation. So just to make it even more confusing. So the legislation, some of you will know about it. The short form is CYFSA, but um, it's the Child Youth and Family Services Act. Uh, 2017. Ontario, uh, and I saw. It came, and it's an Ontario legislation that came into, parts of it came into force in January, and parts of it came into force April, when we were articling. Actually, at the Children's Lawyer, we lived through that legislation change, so that was, that was uh, interesting and intense. But, um, so under the Child Youth and Family Services Act, there's a function for what they call the representative of the band, and for First, for First Nations, um, you know, that's why they call it the band representative. There's also a representative of the child's community, which would be for, for Inuk children and Métis children. Uh, so there's one uh, Inuit community that's being designated under the regulation, so they do receive notification and things like that when a child is involved. Uh, the Métis have so far not had any of their um, communities designated under the regulation. So what my understanding is what happens for the Métis is that they kind of, the Children's Aid Society send out materials to like the Métis locals, uh, which of course don't, um, aren't recognized within the legislation to actually uh, be the rights holders for the Métis people with respect to their children. So they actually don't really get involved in cases because they don't have the capacity. Mm. Yeah, and it's sad. And um, they didn't receive money either to do so because Métis services for Métis children were not a part of this case because this case was about services for First Nations children on reserve. So that's one important, one important distinction. So what I think Maggie is suggesting is that I just tell you a little bit about what it's been like implementing this human rights order on the ground. So this case belongs to First Nations, right? First Nations live through decades of discrimination and First Nations are at the forefront and will continue to be at the forefront fighting for their children. And it's true that First Nations agencies were discriminated against in the, in the way that they were funded, but First Nations agencies only exist because First Nations give them power. So this case belongs to First Nations. And what that means in a practical term is that all of these decisions need to be made real at the level of the First Nations community. So that includes the First Nations government. For those of you who don't know, um, a lot of First Nations are, are represented by a chief and council, which is a body of elected individuals pursuant to the Indian Act. Um, and they are seen as the voice and the, and the government of a First Nation. Other First Nations have also in tandem a traditional governance system. Um, so they have conflicting, or I shouldn't say conflicting, but they have various uh, functions for, for governments and decision making. So under, the, under this legislation, CYFSA, and under the predecessor, CFSA, there's been a role for First Nations to be involved when their child citizens are engaged in the child protection system, actually since 1985. But First Nations were not funded for the last number of years. They used to be funded at $1,500 per case, and now they're funded at actuals, but that $1,500 was cut off. 
So when they had rights under the legislation, they couldn't actually act on them, right? So you would have a child welfare system where every single party was funded, right? So if you think of a child, if you think about the child welfare system in Ontario, uh, and this is something that the, the First Nations agencies struggle with understanding. If you think of the child welfare system in Ontario, there's basically four parties, right? There's the child, which is represented through the OCL. There's the parents, and they have counsel through legal aid. There's the CAS. People sometimes say also CFS. CFS is usually an indigenous agency. And then there's the First Nation. So for a long time, all three parties, all three of these parties received state funding in order to, to live up to their obligations under the law and in order to have a voice in the proceedings involving their children. The First Nation did not. In that case, the CFS, the First Nations Agency, they wore two hats. They were the voice of the nation and they were the voice of the agency. But of course, the agency and the nation, even if the agency is created pursuant to the nation, are sometimes going to have differing points of view. So that is why Maggie fought fearlessly for unlimited funding for First Nations. So First Nations can take up their rightful place under the legislation and their rightful place pursuant to inherent jurisdiction to exercise their rights for their children, youth, and families. Um, so that's what I do on the, on the ground every day, pretty much, is travel from the second most northern community, Gijinawak Husband and Awoke is one of my clients, to uh, Akwesasne, which is the most southern First Nation in Ontario, and a bunch of places in between, talking to community members, families, and chiefs and council, getting them to understand what this case means for them on the ground and exercise their jurisdiction, right? So the kinds of cases I work on are really various. First Nations have different kinds of rights under here. They have like informational rights, so they get information about the children that are in care, and they also have participatory rights. And the way that a First Nation chooses to exercise its rights is really going to de vary depending on the, I would say, the stage of community cohesiveness and organization and a bunch of different factors. So many factors. So many factors. <laughs> and the way that they tend to engage with the court system. So some First Nations just opt out, and so in that case they don't tend to respond to these cases. But so I go in, and I come in to talk about this case, and I come in to help the First Nation um, understand it and exercise their rights. But the first day is always spent talking about the community's experience with the child welfare system. Always. Because that's just the reality. When you're sitting down with leader, and we're I'm sitting down at a table with chiefs and council, and every single person around that table typically has a personal experience with child welfare, or went to residential school, and oftentimes has their own kids in care, their own grandkids in care. And these are the people that are uh, responsible for transforming the child welfare system. And I would say there's nobody better placed. Because the child welfare system is not what the CYFSA says, it's how it's lived in the community. Who gives a shit what it says in that paper if the First Nation doesn't actually um, get to live up to its rights? The paper says nothing. So I feel very privileged that I get to work with people who are transforming the system from a place of lived experience. But that makes my job hard too, I just have to be honest with you, because it's never ever neutral. Talking about child welfare for First Nations is never, ever neutral. So we have to start from a place of, of real humility and move slowly. And because there's resources, we're able to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So I tend to go in and explain the case to people and help them get their funding applications in and do really exciting things um, in that area and then help them to actually respond to some of their, some of their individual cases. One of the really nice cases that I've worked on this year was this, uh, this teenage boy, and he had been brought into care, who's a crown ward, uh, which is the permanent termination of the parental rights and the transference of the parental, the rights of the natural parent to the state. So um, in child welfare, they call it a death sentence. Um, so he was a crown ward, and he grew up in a white foster home and was still not adopted. He was a teenager at this point, had been apprehended at 11, at 11 months old and had never met anyone from his community. Didn't know the name of his First Nation. Had never heard Ojikri, which is his language. All these deep, deep, deep dislocation. And he was the, the second generation, third generation removed from the community. The first, his great grandmother was in residential school and after residential school she left. And then her children were, and then 
you know, she had children. That was his grandmother. Um, and she and her children were apprehended, which is his father, and then he was apprehended, right? So we're talking three generations of removal and two generations of uh, being in, in state care. And so we got to go and meet him in his foster home. And my clients, being my clients, wanted to bring me along with them. And so I went with them and we got to, he got to meet people from his community. He got to hear his language. Uh, we brought a bunch of family photos. And this summer he went to his community on a fishing trip. And they're going to, we're now negotiating a customary care agreement. So we're, we are terminating the Crown Wardship Order and moving towards customary care, which I don't have time to get into, but <laughs> is, a, is a different kind of permanency planning only for Indigenous children. So that's, those are, that's like a very good, exciting case that I got to work on that had a very nice, um, has a very nice story arc to it. And then tell them about the party they had. Oh my good God, yes. And they had a party, <laughs> they had a party for him in the community hall, and they put up all these signs that, you know, I won't tell you his name, but they said, like, welcome home, Bob. Because that's how the community sees him, right? Welcome home. That's, that's how they feel. Nobody's ever met this kid. Nobody's even met his father because their family's been gone from the reserve for three generations, but that's how they saw him, right? And all children in care can find that kind of a place. It's not always gonna be so, it's not always gonna be so straightforwardly positive. There's major issues. And that kind of return or repatriation sometimes ends in a disaster, right? And we know that because children are apprehended and then they return to their communities and they can't speak the language mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of children commit suicide, actually, because of that. Because they're alienated from white culture, and then they've lost their context, and they're alienated from their own community. So I'm not trying to paint a rosy picture here. This is just a particular, very uh, meaningful experience that I got to have as a lawyer to help facilitate that. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's, that's kind of what it's like. <laughs> but then there's also lots of reading tens of thousands of pages of CAS disclosure and lots of fights. And um, lots of, yeah, lots of mess. Yeah. Intergenerational mess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, I'll probably, we can take some questions in a moment. Uh, I, mean, I told Amanda she should have a set of pre prepared questions. She does not. She didn't listen to me. <laughs> Mentee, no more. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever read Tess of the Durbervilles? There's that chapter. Anyway, whatever. You turn the page and it's like, maiden, no more. Anyway, <laughs> Mentee, no more. Um, yeah, so any questions that anybody has about um, the practice of child protection law? Like, we don't actually work for mom and dad. That's a whole other area of child protection law, which is um, not funded on an unlimited basis, that's for yep. sure. Um, that is also uh, extremely important. But uh, so we practice for the, gov the First Nations governments mm -hmm. primarily. I will say, though, sometimes it's, it's complicated, right? So I worked with one community on one case, and I said, I usually take my direction from chief and counsel, and chief and counsel said, uh, we're doing what the grandmother says. And I was kind of like, but, 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 but. but and then they were like, the white girl. the rules of professional conduct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, white girl, shh, shh, shh. This is how we do things, and we're doing what the grandmother says. So there's a lot of learning for me in that. So sometimes, even though we don't represent the parents, we're representing the nation, the nation's view on their relationship to their citizens and their caregivers is, is, is more complex. Parents, yeah. yeah. It can be, because of the cultural context, it can be directed that way. Yeah. But it's, a, I think, a generally a really a very exciting time to be in uh, working in First Nations child protection law, both because I think that there's a lot of openings to sort of reduce the harms that are happening to individual children and families, um, but also to really have a, a focus on strengthening nationhood and strengthening mm -hmm. governance um, and institutions within First Nations to kind of start looking at reversing, uh, reversing the effects of, uh, you know, 150 years of colonialism. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, I apologize because probably people know this in the room, but I don't. Um, how broadly is this construed? Is it right for children who identify as indigenous or who have these titles? Ah. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, that, well, so for Jordan's principal e eligibility, that is something that is currently before the tribunal. Mm -hmm. um, for, under CIFSA, under the um, Child and Youth Family Services Act in Ontario, it's uh, it's an open-ended thing and it, you don't have to be status. And under C92, uh, it also is quite open-ended just as an Indigenous child. I mean, I think that that is something where there will obviously be likely a bit of litigation. Uh, CIFS is actually reasonably clear because there's like regulations mm -hmm. and there's been a bit of case law that's developed. Um, but it's certainly, it would be naive to think that every child who identifies as Indigenous will, or First Nations, for instance, will be able to go and f either find a First Nation that they mm -hmm. can get services from, 
or that you know even if they do find even if they know what first nation they come from because like as Sinead says there's like families and families who are disconnected from their communities and still know that they're indigenous in some way not every community is like necessarily running into court to be like come back to us mm -hmm. um because obviously there's like concerns about scarcity resources etc uh, which are ugly concerns but they're true concerns um and so uh, you don't have to be status but I think that there, that, you know, that there's probably complications arising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a one on. I'm tired of coming to law school. I do a lot of work with um, medically fragile Indigenous children in institutional foster care, um, mm -hmm. as well as in Indigenous foster parents. And, and like my experience here, like um, being in, in the communities while all these decisions were handed down, is just like a, mm -hmm. a disadvantage for both. Yeah. So I think my question to you guys is like, how are you guys feeling in terms of like the success of like in the future of like these le with legislation being like implemented on the ground, particularly outside of Ontario? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, from I, you do much more of the Jordan's helping people with Jordan's principal applications. As far as I can tell, the Jordan's principal application process is as easy as the civil servant han ha handling the Jordan's principal application process. Mm -hmm. So there's a pretty wide variation of the kinds of things that get granted and not, mm -hmm. and. Um, there's different kinds of service delivery models happening in different provinces or amongst different sort of regional subgroups of First Nations. Um, you know, there's there, there was a period where I would say the wallet was like really very, very wide open. But that said, it's not necessarily the easiest thing for First Nations to like get the a grasp on how um, the cases should be going and, and to follow up on them and stuff. So I just think there's a real varied experience. I mean, I'm not... I wouldn't, for me, I'm not pessimistic, which is <laughs> an unusual thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm not pessimistic at all. I've seen Jordan's principle make a huge difference in the lives of individual children and also in the lives of communities. And it varies hugely uh, between the provinces. So Manitoba has spent the most um, in a, on a per capita basis on Jordan's principle for First Nations children and is very organized and very, and might be more recently, and it certainly doesn't reach everywhere. It's not flawless by any means, but Manitoba has done a really good job through the Manitoba Manitoba Chiefs and Ontario has also done a really good job but for example British Columbia which has huge numbers of indigenous people has spent hardly anything in Jordan's principle and that's because communities need to understand why Jordan's principle it is and why it applies to them and how they can own it and in my experience the only way is to actually go to the First Nation yeah. and explain it to them in person over multiple visits and yeah. with a lot of time and uh, humility. So that's what I do, and that's why I'm never in Toronto and um, don't have children yet, and blah, 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 right? <laughs> so it's, um, it's not an easy task, but it's the only culturally appropriate way to do this work, um, and it's, in my experience, the only way that, that is effective. So for all the communities that I work with, the very first Jordan's Principal application we ever do is one for Jordan's Principal Navigators, which is to have staff in the community to assist families to, to complete their applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's mixed, but I think it's I think it's a good news thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was interested. <coughs> sorry, by one uh, thing that I think Sinead mentioned about um, the fight that can ensue between First Nations and DSS agencies. I was just wondering. Oh. I don't know if you um, can disclose any of the details, but I was just wondering about sort of the broad contours of what those fights can look like. Right. So um, yeah. I think what I was saying is that sometimes the First Nations, so these, there's these First Nations Child and Family Service Agencies, which are delegated pursuant to provincial law and are beholden to all the provincial standards and processes. Um, and then there's the First Nations Band Representative Programs, which we tend to call uh, Family Advocacy Programs. So, and they might have, um, they are going to have two different, they might be both within the community, both delivering prevention services, both staffed up entirely by, or primarily by community members, but their objectives are going to be a little bit different. So I, I can give you an example of a case that I worked on. Um, and this is one where the, the tension is not necessarily so great. But so in this particular case, we had um, a parent, we had, uh, and let me think, I have to de-anonymize it in my head. I have to anonymize it in my head. So um, the first, the child had been living with uh, the maternal grandmother and uh, the mother was unable to care for the child, so had been living with the grandmother, and the, and the father had been unable to, to care for the child at the time the child was apprehended, but father had totally cleaned up his act and had 
in, in many ways, the details of which I can't get into, but was doing fine and was putting forward a plan to say, we want, I want to care for my child. I'm ready, I've healed, I'm ready to care for my child. The Children's Aid Agency, this, the um, First Nations uh, CFS agency, they said that they didn't want to disrupt the child's stability because the child was in a caring home with the grandmother um, and that the father didn't have enough of a record to show that he could actually parent the child. The First Nations position was based on their cultural beliefs that parents are always the first caregivers for the child and that parents must be honored on their own healing journey. Those were the, that's almost a quote that I got from the chief of that community. So our position was that that child should be returned to the father and that the father needed to have another opportunity to raise the child. And that, so both positions are, both positions had a cultural context to them. The father lived on the reserve, so there was the heightened access to the child's language and community and culture. But the grandmother was a cookum, and she also had access to language and community and culture. So they're both good positions, right? They're both, they both are supported by the legislation, but one shows the important connection or the importance of the connection between a First Nation and its child citizens, which is direct and literal and isn't about the child having been raised by somewhere else that might also be an Anishinaabe. They want that child in the community and because of their cultural beliefs, they want the parent to have a second chance. So that is an example of a discord that I've had in one of my cases. So it's not like, it's, you know, the fists aren't off, you know, the boxing gloves aren't off, but um, we settled in the favor of the parent because children's aid societies are also very, when band representatives or child advocates go into children's aid and they're represented by a lawyer and they're organized, they are like cowering. They are very afraid. Because if we go to court and say that this, this indigenous agency has failed to respect the position of the chief and council, then it's going to be really bad for them. So. Yeah, I mean, I think also from what I see, like on a much sort of higher level, because I'm usually not too much on the ground with this stuff, is just that the general kinds of things where, uh, you know, the what the current act is really isn't necessarily in accordance with what First Nations believe or in a kid's best interest in reality. And the, uh, you know, lots of times the Indigenous agencies or the non-Indigenous indigenous agencies alike are staffed by uh, you know, non-Indigenous people, but even when they're staffed by Indigenous people, they're incredibly risk averse because they don't want, uh, you know, liability for children being harmed while they should have had their eyes out, which does happen. It's happened, you know, there's been some stories recently about one of the Indigenous agencies in the North, or several of them, that have had some deaths uh, while they're in their care. But I think also there's like a very, to me, in like the sort of the research about child and family well-being and like what makes kids have good outcomes, uh, I think that there is sometimes a little bit of a discord between, well, A, what makes kids have good outcomes and what child and family services agencies actually do, but also like the level of risk tolerance of, of child and family services agencies. And I think lots of general like individual citizens of the world versus, um, you know, and, and First Nations among those people have a different kind of risk tolerance for what level of uh, family dysfunction should be permitted in a yeah. house where uh, families get to stay there. And that is something that is visited uh, pretty disproportionately on Indigenous families and Black families. So for instance, um, I, you know, uh, hello TV world, my dad's white, my mom's First Nations, my dad comes from a family where there was a lot of substance misuse, but nobody would have ever suggested to him or his family that they should have taken him out of that home. And if you asked my dad, should you have been taken out of your home in a family being, from being raised by a family of substance misusers, I am 100% positive the answer would be no. He should not have been taken out of that home. But if you're an indigenous person and there's somebody in your house who's misusing substances, 100% you're gonna get taken out of that home. There is no tolerance for that. Um, and that's a tolerance that we, you know, that's something we tolerate all the time in Rosedale and Forest Hill, but it's not something that we tolerate, you know, in Thunder Bay mm -hmm. or, you know, at, Pekanjikum First Nation or whatever. And so I think that that is something that causes tension as well, is that there's just a real different level of, of um, or a real discord, I think, between what how child services are provided and, and on whom they are provided. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's so. something so important about that question of risk that I just want to add to Megan, so I'm so glad you said that. So children's aid fails to account for the risk of an apprehension. So when a child yeah, is removed from their yeah. family, it is guaranteed to harm that child. But any child will be harmed by being removed from their family. Even if the context in which they're being removed is one of substantiated harm, 
If the child is being harmed in their home, they will also definitely be harmed by being removed. And, so, the, and the little social sciences research that there is on that is frankly it is worse for yeah. kids to be taken out of their it's, homes. Unless there's like an actual physical danger, but like to be taken out of a home where you're, you know, even where mom and dad are fighting if the child's yeah. not exposed to violence, like where there's substance misuse, there's not a lot of research onto this, but generally kids are better off than being taken out of their families and communities mm -hmm. and being put somewhere else. Like kids who go into child welfare are, are adults who go into prison. That's just like how life works. Um, but kids who grow up in crappy homes, and we all know them, or we are them, Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> those people often have great outcomes. So, yeah. it, it, I so mean, part it's a very it is... strange to me. It's very strange that we don't mm -hmm. look at that yeah. in terms of assessing what's most safe for a child. Because part of it, which uh, part of the legal issue here is that for children, and some of you may know this, and some of you may not, is that children can be apprehended on the basis of risk. So children can be apprehended yes. on the basis of risk of emotional, physical, or um, you know, emotional or physical harm, right? So um, that's what often happens. And the rubric, and it actually, there's a, the way the decisions are made is about what step a children's aid society should take is called, the, it's on the eligibility spectrum. You can look it up online. And that spectrum itself fails to account for the harm of, of, of removal itself. Because that's an existential question that the system won't ask itself. Yeah, of course, right with you. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Mm -hmm. This might be a little too vague, but you, you talked um, about sort of more children having to be put into uh, care because they can't get access to health care in that way. Oh, yeah. No, it's not vague. So what happens often in First Nations communities is the only way to access social services is by making your child a ward of the state, particularly for mental health services or other kinds of services. And so what you do, and so for instance, I work with the communities in Labrador, Shaheji and Natwashish, who are the two Inu communities in Labrador. They have a fair number of kids who they have put into state and continue, despite Jordan's principle, to put them in state care on the belief that they will be able to get better mental health services or faster mental health services. And what happens is is what's unfortunate about that is I think when mom and dad are, because it was, it was for a very long time in the communities, literally the only social services provider, and it still is, like certainly in Natrashish, which is a fly-in community in northern Labrador, one of the only ways still to get mental health services, because there aren't any mental health service providers, Jordan's principle aside, if you get your funding for mental health services, there's like no physical person who can provide those services. Mm -hmm. And so I just was like working with a mom the other day and she had um, put her kid into care in order to get mental health services because her kid was displaying su you know, signs of suicidal ideation. And then what she didn't realize when she did it is that um, the CSSD is what it's called there, it's the government who runs the child welfare agencies, had filled out the application form and had mom consent, and she, you know, people's English isn't people's first language. She, she thought she was like voluntarily doing it, and she voluntarily agreed that her child was in need of protection, and to a mm -hmm. bunch of findings under the statute, that um, you know, and she just like she thought she was doing the best thing she possibly could by trying to get her kids some mental health care services and trying to get her into like the Jane Way, which is the you know Newfoundland mm -hmm. and Labrador. Uh, children's Hospital, and what she had done was given her kid into state care mm -hmm. and said and, and and admitted that she was in need of protection, yeah. and now she can't get that kid back. Her yeah, the, you, the kid wants to come home. She's like, I hate the Jane way. Uh, I'll probably kill myself in the Jane way, and and she can't get her kid back because she's agreed to a finding that her child was in need of protection. Mm -hmm. So that's that's and and that happens all over the place, and it still happens. Mm -hmm. I like even like, but I like know a family from that community who put their kid in care because he was blind and he needed to go to a special school for kids who had visual impairments. Like that's just the way to get special education in those communities. Yeah. That's the way to get, uh, that's because the inequality for programs and services is not something that's unique to child and family services agencies. It is across the board with respect to healthcare, uh, education, special education in particular. Like there's very, very few special education supports for First Nations. Mm -hmm. And so that is a way that people try to access systems and it's like it's disgusting obviously mm -hmm. because I think what people don't realize and what we realize more and more particularly in Labrador is that people are consenting and they're consenting that their kids are in need of protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
That is one of the important precedents from this case, though, is that um, discrimination in, in services to First Nations children is, is no longer okay, right? It's going to take, it's going to be a case-by-case -case litigation to fight that out, but this, mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's it a very strong argument that um, discrimination in CFS, Child Family Services, is definitely not okay, but not in other services that also affect, at least on the well-being of children and youth, but on the First Nation as a whole. So. Um, you know, I often work with, uh, I've worked with First Nations who have discriminatory underfunding in other areas, especially education, and um, I always uh, advise them to um, fight about this case, <laughs> bring up this case, <laughs> and say, that this, is, this is my understanding of this, of this case and the precedent and how it applies in this area, and then let the government answer and say, oh, no, actually, you know what, we're actually still going to discriminate in education. So I think it is an important bargaining tool yeah. that First Nations have, but it's not a magic fix. But they also 100% continue to discriminate in the area of education and oh, yeah. all, and infrastructure, like in every area of service provision to Indigenous people, like that is just a fact of life and they don't seem to be particularly swayed by the, you know, by the tribunal's decision. No. I have a question. So, does, that, does anyone else have a question? So, I'm curious because I felt a lot of emotions so far. Mm -hmm. I laughed. Bob's story brought me close to tears. Happy and we love tears. Bob. I cried that day too. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't even there. And and I mean, I'm heartened by these developments and Maggie's amazing victory and the important work that you're doing, Sinead. But I also know that, like, bringing on reserve kids up to the status that everyone else is getting is still bringing them to a really low threshold. And mm -hmm. I know that. We have kids who are in urban centers, who are non-Indigenous, who are being put up in hotel rooms in downtown Winnipeg mm -hmm. and not receiving mental health services. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, how much hope can we have if we're bringing them up to a standard that is abysmal already? And then maybe to end on a more positive note, through your conversations with community, is there some kind of thinking about innovating to create a system that actually works better for everyone? Hmm. Those are very big questions, Amanda. <laughs> well, you have five more minutes. <laughs> um, and, you know, the next 25 years of my career. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so I think part of the thing that we want to talk about or like part of the thing that we advance is the notion of substantive equality. Yeah, like I don't, it, it's so funny to me, like I agree with you sometimes, you know, First Nations or groups of First Nations bring cases for instance, or want to bring equality cases about education and they're like, well, you're just going to get the same crap education as everyone else. Not that our education system is that crap, but like, mm -hmm. I mean, but it's, but it's deteriorating that way. But yeah, the child welfare. So I think there's a conversation to be had about substantive equality or whatever, but I think that there's also... One of the things that the tribunal's decisions talks a lot about is this like notion of needs-based funding um, you know, in order to promote a vision of substantive equality. And I think, so in, 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 to speak to the second half of your question, I think First Nations, I, I don't expect that when most of the First Nations I work with go to design their child welfare laws that it's just going to be sif-sub with like, uh, you know, a different word at the beginning of it. I suspect that lots of people will have really dramatically changed child welfare systems, which include notions of community wellness the, from the very get-go, from like cradle to grave, everybody in the community, because the reality is anyone who spent any time in a First Nations community knows that everyone in that community has experienced trauma and mm -hmm. has had some kind of um, trauma in their lives and so no one is immune from no child is immune from being at risk very likely um, and you know so I think that there will be transformative systems and the question is I think what how do we fund those and will Canada um, be willing to fund those because that is under the new legislation the kind of big hanging question mark in the air which is that there's no statutory requirement for those systems to be funded it's to be left to a matter of negotiation and um, right now um, how they fund sectoral self-government under uh, for child and family services uh, for mo people who have modern treaties or big First Nations uh, your modern treaties or for, for self-governing First Nations is um, the fiscal financing arrangement that is currently in place, which is like frankly a matter of policy, not much one of negotiation, is one that doesn't allow self-governing communities to uh, what they call draw down the jurisdiction because the value proposition of it is too expensive to provide child and family services under the current model under which you could self-govern. Um, and so most, uh, if not all, communities do not uh, run child welfare services 
on a self-governance basis because that's the way that the system is set out. And if Canada insists on that model under the Indigenous child welfare legislation, then it will just be entirely empty. But for those very few communities, and there are some who have so much money that they can just do it themselves, and mm -hmm. that, but there's not very many of them. Mm -hmm. We're talking Northern Alberta oil communities and you know other communities who live near resource-rich developments. Mm -hmm. So um, the question, Amanda, about how do we raise First Nations up children up to like a totally abysmal level? So that's where <laughs> substantive equality comes in, just to to refresh mm -hmm. you guys. So substantive equality is the idea that everything provided off reserve should be on reserve, but that those things sh that the services provided on reserve or to First Nations children on or off rather um, should meet their cultural needs and their their needs arising from historical disadvantage and their needs arising from their particular geographic context. And I think that there's a there's an there's an important part about substantive equality that is connected to I would say jurisdiction. So if the Human Rights Tribunal says that First Nations must be provided um, with funding for child and family services that meet their substantive equality needs that are and to provide culturally appropriate services. Culturally appropriate services are by definition services provided by that child's First Nation because nobody outside of that child's First Nation can truly provide a culturally appropriate service but the First Nation. There are plenty of very important and meaningful cultural services that are provided across Turtle Island that are outside of the particular locus and territory of a First Nation and those really matter and I'm not denigrating them in any way but a truly culturally appropriate service is one that reflects the day-to-day -day realities of that community and is by definition from that First Nation. So if we say that child and family services must be provided in a way and funded pursuant to substantive equality in a way that is culturally appropriate, then we're saying First Nations must control those services, right? Because culturally appropriate services are those designed by the First Nation and delivered by the First Nation. So I take heart in that personally, that comes from the decision, but, um, and I think that First Nations are moving towards that, but I don't think it's, it's going to be an easy route to take. But in terms of feeling um, like what's the purpose, what's the hope for the future and how do I do this work and everything like that, um, I look at it on like a, an access visit by access visit level <laughs> like yeah no, that's how, very granular right yeah like, like very very one granular. community party, like, party, did I help, party for one kid, yeah, yeah yeah one visit for one kid did I help that kid get a wheelchair does did that does that kid go to school three days of three days a month instead of zero days a month like did that mother get to go see her child in a therapeutic foster home in Winnipeg um, did that baby have uh, a you know a high chair like very, very, very simple things is how I is how I think about it. But I also feel um, very heartened and inspired by the welcome that I feel for the clients that I serve. Because if you show up as an ally, as a settler or a mixed person or an indigenous person, but if you show up and you open your heart to First Nations to say, I am here to help you serve your children and I'll take my direction from you, you will be welcomed, right? And you will be able to feel the satisfaction that you get from being welcomed by these communities to, to walk with them to build their systems and make them better. So I feel good because of the relationships I have with my clients and I think that is something very special to practicing Aboriginal law. Like the relationships that you get to have with the people that you serve um, are very special and, and very meaningful and also very difficult. And I get a lot of selfies and all kinds of other weird things. <laughs> but I also get like moose meat and, you know, caribou and all kinds of cool stuff. So, yeah. It's true. It's, I didn't know about the caribou. Oh, I want that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, on that note, I will invite you all to help me thank our guests for being here. <laughs> Tokens of our appreciation. Thank you. For I you. hope it's a mug. It's uh, yeah. not. Aww. <laughs> we might be able Thank to you. Um, <laughs> speaking of funding, I'd like to acknowledge the Law Foundation of Ontario for their funding oh, of the uh, Thank you, Law Foundation. <laughs> Initiative Office Speaker Series. Um, I would invite you all to come back for our last speaker of the semester on November the 20th. That's Caitlin Tolley. And um, in the meantime, on November the 11th and the 21st, we have elders who are coming to teach us about Indigenous law and legal ethics. Um, that's Grandma Pauline is coming mm, on the yeah, 11th in the Rowell Room. Pauline, and, me too. and on the 21st, uh, Dan and Mary Lee Dan and Mary Lou Smoke will be here, also in the Rowell Room. Yeah, me so, too. Uh, thank you all for coming. Take some more pizza on your way up. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>